Hello everyone, my name is Carl. Welcome to my workshop and welcome to my YouTube channel. We're going to be having a bit of a break in this episode from the Harrison Mill restoration and we're going to be looking at making a grinder for sharpening tungsten carbide scraper blades because you'll remember in the last episode I spoke about wanting to learn how to do scraping. Well, there are a few prerequisites we have to have in place before we could do that. The chief of those being having some means of sharpening the scraper blade. So we're going to modify uh, an easily available, reasonably cheap tool um, to allow us to sharpen scraper blades. So uh, I hope you enjoy it. So I want to start talking about um, this adventure into scraping that I want to try and make. And um, by the way, I hope you like this uh, rostrum camera position. I'm experimenting with it at the moment, so hopefully it'll, uh, it'll give me the chance to show you uh, some of the bits and pieces that I need. Um, so obviously the thing that we need for scraping is a scraper. And uh, I've actually gone and, and purchased one, and this is it. Um, it's made by a gentleman who has a website, or a, a YouTube channel rather, called Impractical Machinist. And uh, he manufactured this um, for sale. Um, after using various scrapers that he bought on eBay and um, some that he made uh, or that others had made and he'd bought from eBay that were unsatisfactory in a number of important regards. Um, so this is nicely uh, uh, heat treated and tempered. So it's got some spring to it. It's got a nice turned comfortable handle at the end here um, and it's well, well fitted onto that with a brass ferrule. Also comes with... Um, a piece of carbide to uh, for the blade which uh, by the looks of it has already been ground I'll talk about the the grinding of this and the angles uh, uh, shortly um, so I don't know if you can see that very well um, it's got kind of a grind on it already um, but I'll talk about these angles later on and now why would I buy my own script uh, why would I buy a scraper rather instead of making my own well, uh, my friend Mitch Lees, who you've met before, uh, early on in the Harrison Mill Resto series, we went to his workshop to use a grinder to uh, when, we, when we were making a, a tool for the 5 Acme thread. And he is a luthier, and he said to me um, a very wise uh, statement, which is, if you want to learn to play the guitar, you need a really good guitar. Because if not, you'll become uh, disenchanted with your efforts because they'll be hampered by the, um, the shortcomings of the instrument. So that's why, essentially in a nutshell, why I've bought, my, bought a scraper from someone who makes these, who, who's already put his experience and knowledge and skill into the design of this, so that I'm starting off with something that's fit for purpose, and I'm not going to uh, be uh, held back by the shortcomings of the tools uh, and the equipment that I'm using. So I'm gonna give myself at least half a chance to try and learn how to do this new skill. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I have a lot of things I want to do in my workshop. This is only one of them. So I don't want to spend uh, a lot of time manufacturing and having to go through all the vagaries of um, working out what works best as a scraper and having to go through that process of designing one and making one myself when I can just use someone else's knowledge and skill and purchase one um, to try and get myself a head start in that. You know, I don't want this project of learning to scrape to become, um, you know, have various different sub projects. Uh, I need to use my time wisely while I'm in the workshop. Um, so, so much for the scraper anyway. Or just before I put that down, I'll show you that um, the carbide uh, insert or the carbide blade fits in by means of these two. Um, they're, I believe they're, yeah, they're M5 uh, countersunk screws. So that's the clamp arrangement there. It just... Um, you can see just about see that it clamps down onto the uh, onto the carbide which fits in here like this so I guess if I do find I'm not very tall so if I find that this is too long for me when I'm using it I can always shorten this and and reconstitute that the, this clamping arrangement on the end um, if I need to so I can modify this if, if, it, if it's necessary so we'll put that to one side talking about um, the angles on this obviously we need um, some ancillary kit when we're doing this scraping and one of the things we need is a means to sharpen this um, and obviously because it's, it's carbide it needs to be a slow speed um, option to sharpen it 
So what I'm looking at, and I don't know whether this is going to be a final solution or not, it's an experimental idea, is I have this, um, there's a there's a shop in the UK called Lidl's, a supermarket, and they do, a, I'm sure you're all familiar with this if you're from the UK, and they do a range of various different types of tools, and um, they're pretty good actually for the most part. And this is something that I had, I've had for quite a while now, and I bought it on a bit of a whim. It's just one of those things I, I bought and I thought, that looks quite nice and it might come in handy one of these days. And what it is basically is a, a variable speed um, disc sander um, for, for woodworking, essentially, I would have thought. And uh, you can vary the speed of this with this potentiometer on the top here. So what I've also got is uh, these, um, these are very commonly used to sharpen uh, scrapers and carbide uh, tooling. Um, lots of other people use them on their YouTube sites, you'll see other YouTube machinists. This is, um, the, the, these are diamond lapping discs, so they're, they're pretty thin and, and uh, they have a 16 millimeter diameter hole in the center of them and they're basically diamond coated. And um, this is an 800 grit one, but I've got various other different grits. Now, what this um, this tool came with was a series a gr um, various different grits of sandpaper that have got this this kind of hook and eye concept on the back, hook and loop, if you like, and that's how it fits onto the disc, onto the uh, the, the rotating portion. It's Velcro essentially. So I was trying to think of a way that I could mount these um, these discs onto this, and I, I went through various different iterations of methods where I could make a different. Uh, front piece a different disc that goes on the motor shaft but what I've come up with is is just the, the simple idea of just bonding these two together or, well cutting this to size first and bonding this uh, disc onto the uh, the material I'll bond it onto this initially but then if it works I'll actually get some of the material that doesn't have sandpaper on it and bond them together using a, just your bog standard kind of Evo stick impact adhesive that's the idea so experimentally, to begin with, I'll try and glue or bond this, the, the disc onto, the, onto here, and then we can attach it to the, uh, the unit, and we'll see if this has got enough torque uh, and, and the wherewithal to sharpen one of these uh, carbide, carbide blades, which, um, you know, I'm, I'm reasonably hopeful that it's going to work. The other thing is, is is the uh, is there going to be enough um, shear strength in this bond between the this hook and eye idea to to withstand the uh, the torque reaction of trying to sharpen this and you know perhaps it will perhaps it won't but we'll find out if it doesn't work we'll do something else um, I think what I'll do as well is I'm going to um, put this disc here take it off the shaft of the motor get it in the lathe and I'm going to make um, a little um, uh, a feature in there threaded into it that's going to be um, basically a, a locating feature for this for the discs so when I put them on there so that they are central and concentric uh, as well as being held on by the hook and eye uh, um, idea so we'll have um, basically a, 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 a small stub feature um, that this is engages on this 16 millimeter hole and that'll keep it concentric so those are the ideas and um, let's hopefully, uh, let's see if they work. Um, I mean, the, this thing is quite good. This, this can move up and down. We can, we can set the angle. It's not the best, a bit shonky, but it'll probably work um, to give us the angles that we need um, for grinding this carbide insert. Um, so now I've shown you those things, um, I'm going to look at um, what I've purchased to, um, to use for testing for squareness when we come to actually doing some scraping. So I'll show you that now. So I know what you're thinking. Hey Carl, what's in the box? Uh, so let's have a look. This is a box that this particular item arrived in uh, when it was posted to me. I bought this from eBay. So um, you're going to love this. You are going to love it. So what we have here is a 1950s vintage um, ex-military, ex-British military surface gauge and you can see if I bring it closer it's still in the original wax packaging. So this was put into storage in the 1950s by uh, someone in the British military um, 
and it's never been out of this wax packaging since the 1950s for 70 odd years. So uh, this is going to be absolutely mint when we take this uh, all this this wax off and have a look at it. And it's got the scriber attached to it. Um, it's got the adjusting dial here to make the fine adjustments. So we're going to get this wax off and have a really good look at this. The idea of this is, of course, is to put um, uh, a, a, an indicator on it so we can use it for testing for squareness. Because underneath there, you can't see very well, but it has got the ball end on the on the rod so that we can use it for, for bringing it up to an object, uh, for, to a workpiece and testing for squareness um, in the approved fashion. So my friend Colin Gow, I showed this to him and um, he said to me, that is going to require a video uh, to show people um, just what that's like when you take that wax off after 70 odd years. So uh, this is the video. So uh, Colin, if you're watching, this is for you, my friend. So we'll get this, um, we'll get this thing uh, into some degreaser. We'll get the wax off it and have a better look. So here's the third thing that I want to show you in this uh, journey into scraping introduction. Um, what's in this box? So let's have a look. And this is for the, the squareness measurement um, that we're going to be making on the piece that we're going to be scraping. And this is a very beautiful Batty Tenths uh, DTI. So it's a, it's a nice object, beautiful thing. Um, I bought this from eBay as well um, at the same time that I bought the, uh, the surface gauge. Um, I hope you can see that reasonably well. It's, it's a really nice, uh, nicely made thing. And it's got the uh, the knurled fitting on there, so you can put that into the into a, a surface a surface gauge or any other measuring setup that you want to put it into. Um, now this has been sent to uh, and has had attention from Mr. Bob Dixon, who, if you watch uh, Double Boost, and I'm sure you do, he is um, John Mills's friend who works on uh, measuring instruments like verniers and DTIs, dial gauges and whatnot, uh, micrometers in his spare time and does a beautiful, beautiful job of, um, of refurbishing them and uh, rebuilding them. So I sent this to him and it's had attention from the man himself. So um, it's when it was very sticky when I bought it, but now it's like a new one. It's just absolutely perfect. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. Um, so that's gonna help me to, uh, to, to make my squareness measurements. And, uh, and this is the box that it came in um when it was uh when it arrived it was in a pretty shabby condition but uh, bob's given that uh, some attention as well so that's really nice um yeah so we have got various bits and pieces in place now to uh to start doing some scraping so what we have here is a bit of 316 i believe stainless steel and um i'm just going to take this outside diameter down to 17 millimeters. It's about 17.4 at the moment. I face the end. Um, this is what I'm going to make my um, locating feature out of for this prototype um, scraper um, sharpening uh, device that I'm trying to make. So I'll take this down to um, down to 17 mil. The idea is to put a thread on this, an M6 thread, so I'll have to take it down a bit further. And um, then we're going to put an M6 thread on it. And then once it's threaded into the um, the end of the the the, the sanding disc will then machine it down to 16 mil so it's concentric when it's uh, in the chuck of the lathe. So let's get. That. So we've got this uh, piece now down to about 16.5. On the large diameter, the small diameter is down to six millimeters thereabouts. So we can put a thread on this now. I'll just show you that. So it's good enough. We can put a thread on there. Make a slight undercut into here. Either that, or I think I might um, slightly counterbore the face of the, the where this is going to thread into, just so that it goes all the way home. Um, so we'll get that done now. Okay, so. M6 by one die backed up with the tailstock. So let's.
let's give it a go. The lathe is off, so it can't start. It is now anyway, and um, it's in its lowest gear to kind of lock everything in position. So we'll get this started squarely with the tail stuck back up. And then I think we'll take that out now. I think we'll be all right. To run this all the way down. Right, so you can see what I'm doing here. I'll bring you back once it's got a thread in. So we have an M6 thread on the end now, and you join me as I'm parting this off to leave about 4.5 mil protruding, or rather of the of the large bore, large diameter even, 4.5 mil. at about 112 rpm here and it seems to be managing reasonably well so I'm going to stop now I put a chamfer on the edge and I'll bring you back when it's parted off right so here it is and I would be the first to admit you know it's not the most exciting thing I've ever made or the most interesting thing or the most in focus thing actually but there it is. Uh, let's try and get it in. That's better. So um, it has got a, an M6 thread on it with a little undercut. It's about 4.5 mil width in width. It's just over. Well, it's about half a mil over 16. Um, it's still got the pip on the end, but I can machine that off once I get it actually threaded into the uh, the end plate or the drive plate of the um, the sanding machine. So the idea will be, I'll just get one of these, one of the discs. Here is the disc with the 16mm hole. So this will sit on there like that. Obviously it'll be flush to the, uh, to the back plate. And that'll just give it some location. That will fit into there. So we'll, once we get this screwed into the, uh, the drive plate of the sanding machine, we'll machine this down in situ with it screwed in to uh, to 16 millimeters take that um, take that knob off there as well so this will then be concentric to the plate w with the plate in the lathe so it'll be as good as we can get it so that's what we'll do now we'll go and take the um, the sanding machine apart and we'll get the disc in the lathe so this is what the inside of the unit looks like it's um, a fractional horsepower 240 volt DC motor. We've got some electronics here which appears to be um, rectifying the mains and then controlling the, uh, the the motor voltage using a silicon control rectifier and a potentiometer and an on-off switch. So the the rotating disc on the end is held onto the motor with a grub screw. So we'll take this apart some more and uh, we'll get this disc off and get it in the lathe. So where we're at now is I've got the motor out, obviously it's in the vise, I've taken the fan off this end, a little red fan, I'll show you it, this is it. Um, now I can't bring enough force to bear, this is held on, this disc is held on by a grub screw and the shaft's got a flat on in the similar way that this end has. I've removed the grub screw but I can't bring enough force to bear on that to get that off the shaft with um, just with it held in the vise by the casing, so what I'm going to do is um, dismantle the motor and take out the armature and then uh, put the armature in the vise and that'll give me something to grab onto so I can get this off. So in order to remove this I'm going to have to withdraw the brush gear um, so I can get this end plate off without damaging the brushes so I'm going to do that now. Um, this is just for interest I mean uh, this is nothing to do with you know <laughs> scraping really I suppose but it's just to show you what I'm going through. So we'll get that cap off. There's a spring in there that needs to come out, which I thought there would be, so there it is. We won't lose that. Now I can withdraw the brush 
the brushes just by carefully moving the pigtail back. We'll do the same with this cap for the brushes as well, oh, on this side, the brush cap rather. Uh, it's coming off, there's the spring, we've got it, it's not going to go anywhere. Right, we'll draw this brush with the pigtail. So we're not going to just rip the brush off the armature now, uh, off the commutator I should say. And then we'll get these screws undone. These long screws go right the way through the motor body to the other end cap. You know, I mean, they're self tappers, but what can you do? It, it's built to a it's built to a price, but it's not bad for all that, to be fair. Right. Once we've got this screw out, we can slide off this end cap slowly without. I think there might be some washers in here actually. Yeah, so that's the brushes fully withdrawn. It has got bearings in it, uh, roller bearings, ball bearings, so you know, grateful for small mercies, I suppose. And right, we'll get that washer off. Now, this should come out at this end now if I take it out of the vise. Permanent magnet motor, obviously. So, right. Out it comes, there's the magnets. So I can get this in the vise now, put some tape around it first just to protect it. I'll put it back in the vise and we'll get this disc off. Right, so I've got a good hold of that now in the vise. You can probably just about see where my finger is there. I've got some uh, frog tape around the laminations of the armature just to protect them. Um, so hopefully now I can, now oh yeah, it's coming off, I can bring enough force to bear now to twist this off. There it comes, right. Okay, so what we've got in the end of there is a plastic bush which goes onto the, uh, the, the shaft of the motor. So I'm hoping that there's going to be enough meat on this for me to be able to, to drill and tap a hole into this end so I can put that little button in that we made. It remains to be seen. Um, I think there should be enough. So we'll, get, we'll somehow try and get this into the lathe now. Um, I could be on a hiding to nothing here, but you know, it's worth a go. It's worth a punt. Um, we'll get this into the lathe in some way, shape or form. And we'll try and get uh, get a hole through there. Right, so we've got the rotating disc off the motor in the, uh, in the chuck now. And uh, I've got the external jaws on. It's perhaps not, uh, you know, the best work holding job I've ever done. But it's going to do the trick, I think. It's well held. It's well held. Um, so this black surface obviously absorbs all light like a black hole. Um, so I've got the light angled in so you can basically see as best you can. So I'm going to punch a hole through this now and then we'll uh, see where we go from there. Right, let's see how much meat we've got on this thing now. Let's get the drill out of the way. Mm. Yeah, I think there's about, I would say, probably five to six mil. It's probably enough to get a thread into it. So we'll put the, um, the five mil drill bit through next. I'll bring you back. So tapping drill for M6 by one is 5 mil. Right, we'll get a thread in there now. So I've got the button fitted into the uh, the disc now. I machined a bit of this um, hook material away um, and it's made a bit of a mess of the edge of it but I've tidied it up with the standard knife as best I can. I also machined uh, a little flat onto the disc just to give that a bit of a, a nice flat seating. So we have to take about 0.59 off this now to get it down to 16 millimeters, which is the size for it to fit in the um, the hole on the abrasive disc. Um, I've got a left hand knife tool in. I've had to just angle it over slightly to get it in there. So uh, we'll get a touch off this now and we'll get uh, 
0.59 machined off it. Uh, so we're going to be doing somewhere in the region of about 800 RPM, I think. So we'll get the machine, just make sure that nothing's going to foul, which it isn't. That's good. We'll get the machine fired up. It's not the most concentric thing in the world. Well, it doesn't look concentric because the, the hole that we've made in the material, the, the black plastic material is not concentric. So I'll get a touch off on this now. Right, there we go. Take 0.59 off it. Just dial that in now. There we go, right. I think I'll take a, a bit of a stopping machine. I think I'll take a facing cut off here as well, just to get that down. We need to get that down to about four millimeters. So let me just get something to measure that with. I'm just gonna use a rule because we don't need absolute accuracy for this. see what this is now so that's currently 4.5 mil so we'll take 0.5 off it just move the stop and I'll set the tool back square again which is there. Are we going to have clearance for clearance? Let's have a look. Let's get him in somewhere near. He's not touching, he's just near. Yeah, we'll get away with that, I think. So we'll take half a mil off there. We'll get a touch off and then we'll take half a mil off. So I'm just using the compound or the, the top slide to, to dial that in, just feeding it by hand. speed I think. Right, I think we'll we'll get in there with the um the bevel tool, 45 degree tool, and put a little chamfer on that. I'll bring you back when I've done that. Right, so I've taken another slight facing cut off this because there was a little pip left. The, um, the left hand tool was actually slightly below centre, so I adjusted it and I got rid of the pip. 
I put a little bevel on the um, a little chamfer on the edge now. So here is one of the the grinding or the the lapping discs, and um, let's see if it goes on. Yeah, that's just exactly what I wanted. That's perfect. So that's going to keep that concentric or centralized. Um, so what we'll do next is we'll glue the um, the material, the Velcro material, onto the back of. Oops, that nearly did for it. Onto the back of one of these discs, and we'll have a go and see if we can't sharpen that uh, that carbide. So here we go, folks. As you can see, I've now got the uh, diamond lapping wheel uh, bonded to the sandpaper material with a hook and eye on it, and that's fixed to the the driven wheel or the driven plate on the on the sander. Here's the button that we made, and that's um, giving us a nice locating feature for the uh, for the lapping wheel. This little table here can be angled, and there's um, there's graduations on this side showing you the angle. I've got it set to about eight degrees at the moment. So uh, if I switch it on, I suspect that that may be going a little bit too fast. Still, I think that's probably about 180 to 200 RPM, and I'm going to try and make it go a bit slower. Um, by fiddling around with the electronics, but uh, I'm going to give you a demonstration now, and it actually does genuinely seem to work. So let's try it out then um, on camera. And I've tried it beforehand, as I've said. Um, I think you can see what I'm doing. So I've got the table set to um, eight degrees with the graduations on the side. I know it won't be perfect, but it's somewhere near. Um, and they reckon, well, everything I've read says five to eight degrees for the uh, for the angle, uh, the rake angle, negative rake uh, of the blade. So let's see if we can uh, put um, some kind of a grind on this now. Um, right, so flat on the table. I'm no expert at this, so bear with me. Do the other side. Right, let's have a look and see what that looks like. I mean, I'm happy with the way this is working. I, I think the speed's okay. Um, it, it's certainly not having any of the issues that I thought it might have. It seems to have enough power to do the job and um, this isn't shearing off with the torque reaction as I'm grinding the, the carbide. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm reasonably happy with the way this is working so far. So let's have a look and see what we've produced. Um, I'm going to zoom in on this, I think, and then try and focus it. Because uh, I'll be on a hiding to nothing otherwise, I think. Right, let's see if we can get that to... Now, I think... That doesn't look too bad. I mean, all right, it's not perfect, um, you know, but I suppose it doesn't have to be really, does it? It just has to do the job. Um, can you see that? It's, it's kind of focusing now. I'm, I'm reasonably happy with that result, actually. I don't think that's too bad at all. Right, we'll zoom it back out again. I mean, it looks something like what it's supposed to look like. So uh, I think this could be a goer for sharpening these uh, these scraper blades. I really do. Um, just got to watch out for the radius. I think I've um, I've killed the radius there. I've got I've made it a bit too shallow. Um, they talk about between ninety and one hundred and twenty millimeters for the radius um, for general purpose work. Um, I'll show you that on the whiteboard in a minute anyway. Right, this is just a very quick, and I mean very quick, uh, stretch in front of the whiteboard um, because I know nothing about this stuff. I'm a complete novice, uh, plead ignorance. I'm just showing you um, a few facts about uh, the uh, angles and, um, and the setup of these uh, scraper blades that I've read about and that, uh, that I... Um, uh, to the best of my knowledge correct 
please feel free to correct me or to, uh, to tell me what you actually think and um, tell me what the truth is. So the radius of the actual blade, um, this radius here, is recommended to be in the region of 90 to 120 millimeters for just normal kind of um, general work. Um, and, I, you know, I, I would imagine that basically the the shallower the radius, the bigger the, the, the trough you're going to get when you scrape because you've got more um, surface area of the tool in contact with the work. And when we talk about negative and positive rakes, um, this is just quickly to explain. I know you guys all know about this stuff, but, uh, you know, there could be somebody watching that doesn't. But positive rake is um, basically when the, the, the cutting tool makes an angle greater than 90 degrees with the with the hypothetical surface being cut which is the red line here so this is kind of like um, I suppose a wood chisel would be a good example of of a positive rake tool and negative rake is when um, the angle between the cutting surface and the workpiece is less than 90 um, as is the case with these uh, these scraper blades and so this is kind of a, a, a cross section of the of the tip of the blade and um, it generally is recommended, well, everything I've read and seen um, is between five and eight degrees for that angle there. And most people sharpen them um, at both sides, so you've got two cutting edges. So when this one goes blunt, you can flip it over and use the other one. Um, now, I should probably say at this point that um, most of what I know, in inverted commas, about this stuff, I've learned from Matt Look at Look Creations, and he has got... Um, excellent uh, tutorials on his uh, YouTube channel about scraping and um, a lot of really good knowledge on there. He learned how to scrape from uh, a real expert, someone who was a machine rebuilder and had been doing it for many, many years. So uh, his, his channel is well worth a look if you're interested in this type of thing. And um, I would regard him as um, an authority on the subject, certainly in, in the UK. Uh, on YouTube. I don't think there's anyone else um, that I know of that uh, so that knows as much about scraping and has done as much. Um, he's turned machines that, you know, you would think were scrap metal into, you know, wonderfully accurate, um, uh, fantastic machine tools again. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to wax too lyrical about it because he would never describe himself in those kinds of terms. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you want to know about scraping, then have a look at Look Creations. So let's have a bit of a break, just a quick interlude from the um, carbide uh, grinding scenario and I want to ask your opinion about something. I've uh, had a box full of these cutters now for a long time and I recently found it, I'd forgotten I had it. They were given to me by a friend um, and I'm not really sure where they came from. I think they may have come from Doonray Nuclear Power Station. Uh, don't worry though, they're not radioactive, they don't glow in the dark. So they're big uh, Clarkson type uh, style shank on them. Um, this shank is 25.4 mil, so it's an inch basically, um, and the actual diameter of the cutter is getting on for two inch. It's about 50.59 millimeters, something like that. Now, what I was thinking about what I could do with these is um, I could turn down this shank uh, and use them like you would use a shell mill. If I could turn that shank down to um, to 20 mil or thereabouts, which is the the diameter of the biggest ER32 collet that I've got. I could put these in the chuck and use them in my mill. Um, now it's got obviously got centers in it for sharpening purposes. Um, so what I was thinking I could do was to um, put this between centers in the machine in the lathe and um, make a big lathe dog and put it between centers and then turn this shank down in the lathe. Um, I'd have to drive it against the flank of the, the cutter um, I probably have to put something in there like a piece of copper or aluminium to prevent damage to the to the flanks um, whilst the the lathe dog's tightened up against it um, and then turn this down um, and obviously concentricity is going to be the the issue I guess once it's in the 30 er32 collet chuck but my lathe is pretty good it's well set up so it should be it should machine this down and it should be there should be no taper in it um, and between centers it should be nice and concentric. Um, so let me know what you think. Is it a goer? Um, is it worth a shot? Um, 
uh, please put your answers uh, in the comments below. Well, folks, there you go. Um, it seems like I've produced a serviceable, or at least semi-serviceable, way of um, sharpening the carbide uh, blades of the scrapers. Now, um, perhaps there's a reason why this won't work, and you can tell me what that is. I am a complete novice uh, at scraping. I know nothing whatsoever about it, and I'm here, you know, I, I really want to learn. Um, so if I've got anything wrong um, during the course of this video, be it about the angles required for the cutting edges or anything else, uh, then please let me know. Um, I'm sure that if I have got anything wrong, someone's going to let me know. As soon as you mention scraping, you get a, a plethora of opinions. Um, so I'll try and pick the best out of those. Um, and uh, it'll be part of my steep learning curve, which I'm uh, about to embark upon. So I'll be doing the scraping uh, in and amongst other projects, so I may not actually get around to doing any for a while. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm definitely at the start of a long journey, I think. And um, this is just the beginning, uh, producing this little tool to, um, to, to put uh, a nice edge onto the, onto the blades, which I believe to be, um, you know, it, it's, it's paramount before you start actually moving towards doing any scraping is to be able to put an edge back on, on the tungsten carbide. Um, and I'm quite pleased to have done it this way because uh, I think I've done it slightly differently to how others on YouTube have done it. Um, and it only remains to be seen actually whether or not it's going to be any use and um, hopefully it will be. So anyway, um, that's the end of the video. Um, thank you very much for watching and thank you also to my subscribers. Thank you for your time and for your interest and for your comments and all your support. It really does mean a huge amount to me. And if you're watching this video and you're not subscribed, please consider doing so because um, I've, I've got quite a lot more interesting ideas and things that I want to do. So uh, it'll be great to have you along for the ride and also to have your input as well, which is very important to me. Um, so until we meet again, uh, take care of yourselves and I'll see you again soon.